Assalamu alaikum to some of you and uh, general greetings and well wishes to the rest of you. Um, I will begin with the name of Allah, the compassionate and merciful. And I testify that he is the only deity to worship. There's no deity to worship except him. And I testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is his slave, servant, and messenger. And uh, I ask Allah to guide our hearts and our tongues and our hands. Um, I'll go ahead and cut right to the chase because I've recorded this twice and I've tried to make it short without leaving out things that are important and also without talking too fast for you to understand. I'm going to tell you a story with a moral lesson to it. When you hear the story, you'll understand the lesson. There are three main characters in this story that you need to know by name. And yes, the names have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty alike. First character in the story is Iqbal. Iqbal is your um, successful American Muslim. Came to the U.S. Now, he had a good start when he came to the States, but he'll tell you he came with nothing and he made it. Um, but, or at least he would have at one point. But uh, Iqbal was very involved, highly involved in a, a, a masjid that was run and funded by other professionals like himself. He was on the board and he was one of the speakers, the main speakers after the Imam. He gave more talks at the masjid than the Imam did, sometimes giving Friday khutbas, sometimes not. <laughs> he definitely would make the announcements and gave a few talks on weekends and things like this. So um, he was uh, very active and quite happy with his life. Um, he just wished that the Muslims were more involved and more integrated into American life. And then there's Samuel. And you see, Akbar was giving the Friday khutbah one day, and Samuel, uh, unnoticed by anybody, had been coming to a few talks and a few um, Friday jumas, Friday uh, khutbahs, and he would slip in, slip out unnoticed. But this particular Friday, he came up after the khutbah and the prayer were over, and he shook Iqbal's hand and said, Salaam Alaikum, how do I become Muslim? And Iqbal's uh, eyes got big and his eyebrows jumped up. And he said, you want to become Muslim right now, right? And the man said, yeah, I'm convinced the religion's real. I just want to like, become like you. I want to actually make sure that I am a Muslim, you know, while there's time left, because I don't have any doubts about the religion anymore. And Iqbal looked him up and down. Wow, subhanAllah, you? So you know about the Isra and the Miraj? What's that? The story of Muhammad uh, when he went from Mecca to Jerusalem. Yeah, you believe he went on a, on a horse very fast. Yeah, Allah can do what he wants. Why not? Uh, okay, you, you believe him. He, he kind of quizzed him a little bit. It took about 13 seconds overall, but he just asked about a few things that he thought might be hard. You believe in this? Yeah. Man, look, I'm... So he, he caught himself, but he raised his voice a little bit, said, yeah, man, look, I came here to become Muslim, and he... He called him, I'm sorry, I came here to become Muslim. So then Iqbal got on the microphone and said, Brothers, we got somebody that wants to join the fold. Get ready to welcome your new brother. And everybody said, MashaAllah. And the people um, said this, and Samuel didn't know what MashaAllah meant, but he knew they were happy. So Iqbal walked him through the Shahada in English so that he knew what it meant, then walked him through it in Arabic so that he said it exactly as it should be said. And when he was done, Iqbal hugged him, embraced him, and whispered in his ear and said, don't accept any dinner invitations tonight, my brother. It's on me this evening. Then he let him go so everybody else could come and hug him. Everybody came and hugged Sam, and he looked him up and down, subhanAllah, like, like he had come off a spaceship or something. And Samuel didn't understand why they looked at him like that, why they looked him up and down, but they welcomed him. And he appreciated it. He hugged them back. Salam alaikum. I'm glad to meet you, too. And he, he and Later on, he said, Iqbal, they, they welcomed me almost. I'm sure that I didn't deserve that kind of welcome. I appreciate it, but what's so special? I, I, I didn't do anything that good. And Iqbal said, well, see, brother, you're, you're free from sins now. You, you're going to sin again later, but right now, all the sins you committed have been replaced by good deeds, and you still keep your good deeds that you did. So your record is like spotless right now, brother, subhanAllah, mashallah. And he looked him up and down again, and, and, and Samuel said, see, you're doing it again. You're looking me up and down. What's going on? And so, um, Iqbal um, said, I'll tell you with dinner tonight. 
So at dinner that night, Iqbal had him over, and Iqbal said, look, um, tonight you can stay as my guest, but listen, and we got a toothbrush and all that, don't worry about that, but listen, um, whatever happens to you because you became Muslim, whatever your people do to you, you know, the Americans, uh, just let us know, and I and a few other brothers, we can make sure you're, you're never going to be homeless. You won't even have to sleep in a, a, a bad area for becoming a Muslim. If you lose your job, then you, you're going to have another way to earn money. We're going to make sure that you don't fall down, so to speak. Your life doesn't become a mess because you accepted Islam and your people turn you out. Um, Samuel said, well, you know, I already went ahead and told, told my parents. I went ahead and just went through the, got that over with, said I'm Muslim. I didn't even know how to become one. I just told them I'm Muslim. And they said, no, you're not. They're not going to accept you. And Iqbal said, contrary. No, no, no. Yeah, look, you're my brother, and I'm not going to let you fall. And other people are not going to let me fall. They're not going to let you fall either. We got you. You are covered. And if, if, when you decide to get married, we're going to help you with that too. As a matter of fact, I'll tell my daughters to look for somebody for you. And if I think for one second that one of them wants to marry you, I'm going to ask her, do you want me to introduce the two of you? It's up to her. I'm going to leave it to her. But if I think that's what's going on, I'm going to ask her. So, you know, I hope you're not too shy. And Samuel said, you willing to do all this? And the man said, this is what Islam is all about. So, Samuel got the welcome of his lifetime. And that's good, alhamdulillah. That's exactly what we should be doing as best we can. So Samuel moved up. He became assistant spokesperson. The main spokesperson said, let's switch places. I'll be the assistant, you be the spokesperson because your English is better and you write well. Samuel didn't want to, but, you know, the man said, I insist, actually. You're doing me a favor. You know what? I'm not going to be the spokesperson anymore. You, they're going to push you up anyway, so go ahead. So um, they began to take his input in the masjid board, the committee. Some people say he was a part of the committee, and some say he was not, but I don't know which one. It's, it's debatable. We do know that he took um, the... Uh, uh, we do know that they took his advice. He gave his input because they would ask for it. And then uh, he, was start, he started giving talks himself and helping Iqbal out. Iqbal was like, subhanAllah, I got some free time. You give some of these talks, I give some. We split it. <laughs> MashaAllah. And so uh, one day Samuel was giving a talk. <laughs> and when he finished the talk, a man stood up from sitting down and listening. A man stood up from the audience. And... Uh, with Samuel giving talks, the size of the audience had grown to about a third of the size of the Juma prayer. In other words, about a third of those that would go to Juma would also go to listen to Samuel's talks on other days of the weekend or week. So uh, one day, um, a man stood up, walked up to Samuel and said, Salam Alaikum, sir. I'm ready to become Muslim now. And so uh, when... Uh, Samuel heard this, his heart became warm, and almost a tear ran down his cheek because he remembered everything Iqbal had done for him, and he wanted to return the favors, and he thought, now is my chance to do the same things that were done for me. If I can't do them for Iqbal, then I can do them for this guy and get the rewards, inshallah. <laughs> you know, his heart was filled up with goodness because he was touched by the welcome he got, and other brothers had helped him too, mostly Iqbal, though. So he was like, now I get to take him under my wing and, do the, and pass it forward. And we can start a cycle, a chain, and as every one of us takes in somebody, we can move up in rank, inshallah, in Allah's eyes. Because that in his heart, Samuel meant what he said when he took the shahada. And the way that we want acceptance from other people, Samuel wanted approval and acceptance from Allah. And may Allah make us all like this. So, he said to the brother, you want to become right now, right? Yes. Okay. Gladly, man. As long as you're sure, I'm in your corner. All right, I'm going to walk you through the shahada in English so you know what we're saying. Then I'll walk you through it in Arabic so that you're saying the same thing everyone says when they become Muslim. And in this way, we cover all bases. Fair enough? And the man said, yes. Uh, what's your name again, by the way, brother? Uh, my name is Adam. Okay, Adam. I'm Sami. My birth name is Samuel. Well, they call me Sammy. I'm glad to meet you. Actually, your name is better than mine. You got a more Muslim name than I do. Really? Yeah, yeah. You don't get more Muslim than that. The first Muslim in the world. Think about it. The first Muslim, Adam. And Adam nodded his head and said, yeah, it does make sense. He was the first Muslim. I, I guess I do have a Muslim name. And Sammy said, yeah. 
You do actually. You got one of the most Muslim of Muslim names. See, you got the name of, of a prophet. The first prophet, actually, the first man. That's one of the best names. So you don't need to change your name. You don't have to. You can, but you ain't got to. Anyway, let me get the shahada out the way. Let's get you in the fold, like formally speaking. <laughs> so he did it. And Sammy thought in his mind, I wish Iqbal could see me giving shahada like he gave me one. And subhanAllah, as Adam read the shahada in Arabic after he said it in English, he was repeating after Samuel, Iqbal walked in. And Samuel, knowing Iqbal, thought Iqbal might shed tears of joy. At least he's going to smile and say, say the takbir out loud. And Iqbal looked, and he had a nice, slight smile on his face, but nothing outward. Iqbal walked up behind Adam. He shook Adam's hand after he was done. He hugged Samuel and then stepped aside so everybody could hug Adam. And the guys came up, but nobody hugged Adam. And Samuel thought, the hell, man? They hugged me? What's wrong? But he didn't say anything out loud. Iqbal asked Samuel, you free tonight? And Samuel said, the question is, are you free tonight? Because uh, uh, dinner, his dinner's on me. So you come and join in. And Samuel said, I wish I could. But the thing I needed to know if actually I could steal you for what I got to do. But keep your promise. Uh, it's nothing like, you know, you don't need to break your promise to him. Keep your word to him. Salam alaikum, guys, y'all be good. Nice to meet you, Adam. And he left. And when he walked out, Samuel tapped Adam on the shoulder and pointed at the door that Iqbal had just left through and said, he did so much for me when I became Muslim. A lot of people have, but he did the most. He was always there. He did all this for me. And honestly, man, if you need the same help that I might have needed, I'm going to do all for you that I can because he did it for me. So I'm gonna take, he did a lot for me and I can't repay him. So you're just going to have to take me giving it to you. And Adam laughed and said, hey, thank you, man. I, I, I hope that it's easy for you, but look, man, uh, may Allah bless you either way it goes. And so he took Adam, he fed Adam that night. And he said to Adam, look, this is what they did for me. And this is what they told me. So if you go through this, 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 and this. And Adam said, well, you know, I appreciate that. But my people aren't, I don't think they're going to give me too much trouble. I think it'll be all right. But thank you, man. And, and may it never come to this, inshallah. Uh, so, time went on. And Samuel tried to do for Adam a lot and try to integrate him and all this. And Samuel found that he couldn't get positions for Adam. And he found that he couldn't get Adam, he couldn't get dinner invitations for Adam. And he found that he couldn't get the same help for Adam that Iqbal had gotten for him. He tried, but he couldn't get others to join in, so he just did it himself, if Adam ever needed it. You understand? So Samuel realized that they were not treating him and Adam the same way. So one day, uh, Adam said to Iqbal, look, man, I want to do something nice for the guy that did everything. I mean, Adam said to Samuel, I want to do something nice for the guy that did everything for you. What did you say his name was? Iqbal. Yeah, Iqbal. I want to do something nice for him and you. Samuel said, you know what? Let's both do it for him. Adam said, hey, look, I'll do it for you. You do it for him. Either way, man. But I want to return the favor. <laughs> so, and I want him to know that, that this is because of what he did for you. I want him to understand that. They couldn't get Iqbal to, get, to take the invitation. And when Samuel went to talk to Iqbal himself, by himself, <laughs> he said, well, he wants to do something nice for you because of what you did for me. What can he do? And the man said, man, look, you don't, Iqbal said to Samuel, man, look, Samuel, you don't have to do all of this for him. Thank you. That's nice of you, but you don't have to do all of this for him. And he said, but you did it for me. Why not? I can't repay you the favor, so why not pass it forward? Then he does it to someone, and then that person does it to someone. And as long as we keep this going, each one of us gets a recurring deed, recurring good deeds that just multiply. <laughs> imagine, you know, imagine being in your grave and... And, 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 and it gets better and better and better for you in the grave because this is a cycle that's, that's perpetuated. Imagine the possibility, man. Imagine that. And Iqbal said, oh, yeah, that's nice, brother, but you know, you don't have to do all that for him. Why not? Well, you know, brother, everybody's not the same. We've got different fingers. Not all the same. Yeah, but we're all equal. Yes, but we're not all the same. I don't get it. What is your problem with Adam? 
No, it's, it's, brother, it's nothing. Just don't overstress yourself to do so much. That's all. I'm just looking out for you. And that's what Iqbal said. Later on, uh, one day the committee called Samuel and asked him for advice. They were facing a decision they needed to make. They had a certain amount of money. And what they could do is they could either use that to, to expand the masjid to take in more people for Juma, but they would have to take out a small loan to cover the small difference in cost. Or what they could do is they could uh, spend the money to make repairs. No loan needed. And Samuel immediately thought, I got it. I know just what we could do. The decision is up to you, but here's my suggestion because this is like, this is, this will solve so many problems. There are temporary shelters or like tents that can be put up just for Juma. You don't have to expand anything at all. <laughs> they can put up long tents just to hold the extra rows and things like that, the extra ranks. <laughs> temporary, you put them up, you take them down, no expansion needed. But you make the, you use the money to make the repairs to the roof and the wudu station that you need to make. We need to make the repairs. You, you take that money and with what you have left over, it'll be enough to put up these temporary shelters. And I know an architect who can find people for the shelters and for the repairs, and you might even save more than you thought. It's possible. <laughs> okay, brother, thank you. That's a good idea. Everybody nodded their head. Yeah, that, that idea is good. And he said, well, I know y'all got to discuss it, but you look like you want me to go ahead and call the architect. Yeah, go ahead. All right, I'll call Adam right now. Oh, brother, you ain't got to do that. We'll discuss it. Really? He didn't say Adam's name intentionally until that point because he was testing them. And they failed. He knew at this point they had a problem with Adam. What was the problem, you ask? Well, I never told you in the story that Samuel was white and Adam was black. You see, I neglected intentionally to tell you all this. Now, the next Friday came and uh, Iqbal gave the khutbah, then led the salah, then Samuel came up, turned the microphone back on afterwards, and made an announcement. We are taking up collections for another masjid to be begun, not too far from here, right outside the door. We hope you can help us out. Thank you very much. If you can't, may Allah reward you anyway. He walked out. And he had stood right next to Iqbal and said this and walked out and didn't say anything. And Iqbal walked out of the masjid and saw Adam and Samuel um, holding out buckets, taking up a collection. And he, saw, he saw this and he walked up and he said to Samuel, what is going on? And he looked at Adam and said, did you put him up to this? And Samuel stepped in front of Adam and between him and Iqbal, grabbed Iqbal and shook him and said, you treated me like you should have. You welcomed me with open arms. I could have wind up becoming your son-in-law and would have been glad to do it. You did so much for me. I still feel embarrassed by your generosity, but you only did it for me because I was white and I tested you and found out. You and the other committee members, you are racist. You welcomed me with open arms because I'm white, not because I'm Muslim. And you turned him away because he's, or you, you were cold to him and distant with him because he's black, even though he's Muslim. No, brother, we didn't. Yes, you did. I tested you. And guess what? He's the architect. Not only that, but he's the one that's been giving dawah to his relatives. I've been afraid to give my parents dawah. I've been afraid to, to advise him to become Muslim. My people don't accept Islam like that. I'm rare. It's not normal for us. But his people, at least they listen, and he's told them about Islam. And he's got some cousins that are studying it. So if anything, now he's better than me because some of his relatives came, are coming into Islam through him and studying about it. And not one of my relatives is willing to follow me, and I'm not even willing to tell them that they should accept it. They won't listen. So he's better than me, and yet you treated me better than him for the wrong reasons. What if I had come in and I was black? You wouldn't have done all of these things for me, and this hurts me. And you wouldn't even let him do nice things for you. 
when you fix this, and Samuel raised his voice so everybody could hear, and Samuel then let Iqbal's clothing go, and he said, when you fix this in yourself, then we're on your side, but we're leaving this masjid, and whenever you're ready, you come to us at the new masjid, and we're on your side, we'll be your brothers. But this hurts, man. It really hurts me more than it hurts you. Now go fix that racism in yourself and come see us when you're done. We'll be waiting. We'll leave the light on for you. It hurt Samuel, but he had to be tough with Iqbal. And he put his arm around Bilal and he told the rest of them, if you all had shown the same welcome to him that you showed to me, none of this would have happened today. But you showed who you are. And he shouldn't have to tolerate this at all. So to those of you who are against, want to take a stand against this, come with us. And to those of you who want to stay here and stay comfortable trying to get acceptance from my people who I left, they'll never accept you. Stay here and keep trying and waste your time. But figure out which one you're going to be. A line in the sand is being drawn, literally. And I do not apologize for doing it. And Adam spoke up and Adam told the people. People, let me tell you something. My family, my parents have said they will never join. They will never accept. And they, they told me they won't do it because they know how you all are. So my parents have told me that they're going to die non-Muslim. And I'm going to ask Allah to give you the full punishment that you have earned for, the, your, for your share of the guilt, your share of the blame for my parents' situation. They're not going to escape it. I already know. But you, I ask Allah to give you your full share of the blame. Not to let you off for one second. Unless you go back to your communities and you confront them about this. And the people heard this and a lot of them got scared. And they, a lot of them had bad dreams at night because they knew. And they knew that this man was making dua against them until they went and confronted their communities. And some of them went and confronted the communities and some of them didn't. And the ones who went and confronted the communities got kicked out and they went and joined that new masjid anyway. So the community got split. Now, this is how the community got split up. That's not where the story ends. Let me tell you a little bit more that happened. The community that was new, that Adam and Samuel, uh, in a sense, um, you could say watered or seeded or fertilized, promoted, um, their new community grew in number. And part of that was at the expense of the old community and that old masjid. That old masjid was big and it was expensive. So his property taxes were high. <laughs> now, by the time all of this had blown over, uh, this was a 2003 about to turn into 2004 when all of this had blown over and, and the community became split. And so um, over a period of the next four years, the community dwindled. And they fell behind in their property taxes. By 2008, um, the county had foreclosed on the property that the masjid belonged to. Now, the masjid had no mortgage, but they just had property taxes. And honestly, when the masjid couldn't pay it because by 2006, there were 13 employed men in that community left and their families. And 13 employed men could not cover the property taxes for that masjid. So by 2008, the county foreclosed because they were too far behind. People began to move away. They had already begun to move away. So now these 13 didn't have a community. And this is just the families. I mean, the families are not counted in 13 altogether. The average was somewhere between 52 to 58 total that were left left living and going to that masjid. The masjid was built for 3,000. And so the masjid was boarded up when the county foreclosed. And then 2010, a Buddhist group had paid the property taxes, the back taxes, acquired the property, um, 
opened up the masjid as a Buddhist temple. They had opened it up by 2010. They did it in 2009. By 2010, more Buddhists were moving in to replace the Muslims that had left. And uh, by 2012, you see, when the masjid closed, the school closed. When the school closed, families with kids had to leave. So by 2012, you were left with only, uh, you were left with two households with Muslims in them, still living there, practicing. <laughs> and they had to go to other places to pray. So, one, and both of them were old. The reason they were still there was that bottom line, uh, they were getting old. One was too tired to move, but the other one was actually too old to move. And then he got sick. And the one that was too old to move called a younger brother of his uh, in another city and said, come visit me, I'm ill and I don't know if this will be my last uh, illness. So the other younger brother showed up and he had not been to that city since before 9-11 had happened. So when he was, when he, during his last visit, it had been a vibrant community centered around the masjid. When he came this time in, two, uh, two, in 2012, um, he was more surprised at the community's change than his brother. He said, they got a statue of Buddha in the masjid courtyard. What happened? And the older brother who was ill said, it's not a masjid anymore. We lost people because some, some of the guys were, were talking about racism and they couldn't deal with, uh, they couldn't tolerate it. And so they, they split the community up. They divided us. Um, it was a white guy and a black guy. And they divided us. And people left. And there was not enough left to pay the property taxes. So they got the county foreclosed. And some Buddhists bought it back in 2009, about two and a half years ago. They paid the property taxes, got the property, <laughs> opened it back up. Now it's a Buddhist temple. And the younger brother said, wait a minute, hold up. The Buddhists came and got it in the end because the Muslims left. And brother said, yeah, some, some left for other places because, you know, they, they, so a lot of them left to go to this other masjid. Some left because we just couldn't keep the masjid. And so they went looking for other masjids. And the younger brother said, mind you, the younger brother had not even sat down yet in his brother's house with his bags. And he said, why didn't you leave at that time? You stayed here because you, you stayed here because you were racist, if that's what it was. And the older brother said, no, I'm not a racist. You know me. And the younger brother said, no, you are. If you stayed here, if that's the reason why you stayed, you stayed here because you're a racist. If the rest of them left to start something that's not racist, you stay because you're racist. I was here last night. I was here before 9-11. I know the people that were here. And he shamed his older brother. And he told him, if you stayed here because you didn't want to confront racism, then you deserve this illness. And he left shortly after. Then the other old man that stayed do y'all know why, uh, y'all know what happened to him? When he was by himself, the sick man died. So the other old man that was left, uh, he was by himself. And he was surrounded pretty much by Christians and Buddhists. There were no more Muslims left. By 2015, he had left Islam. He didn't become a Buddhist, but he had left Islam. He couldn't stand to be isolated. He was the only one there. And he wasn't going to join that other community because at the end of the day, you know what it was? He couldn't confront people about racism. So he died a non-Muslim. And then there was no, this community by the beginning of 2016 was not there anymore. There wasn't a Muslim around. Wasn't there. 9-11, there was a Muslim. It was, it was a block, a square block with a masjid in the school and uh, 15 years later, there was one ex-Muslim left. And by the beginning of 2016, um, there was not one, even ex-Muslim was gone. And this was because 
the community there, um, they did not notice that they were preferring one convert over another, but they were. And they didn't care, not all of them cared when somebody pointed it out. And it was the convert that they had wanted so badly to walk through those doors one day that walked through the doors and accepted Islam and later saw what they really had in them and called them out on it and split up their community. He began the process by which the community either had to not only confront this problem, but migrate or perish and lose their Islam and see, evaporate and cease to be a community. So it was the very thing which they wanted so badly that began the demise of the ones who stayed behind and would not follow them. The apple cart was upset, so to speak, by the one that they were looking for to come in and not upset the apple cart. In the end, it wasn't the one that they preferred that was the problem. He was the solution. It was the one that they preferred and the one that they dispreferred that were the solutions to the problem. And they who decided to remain a part of the problem wound up being evaporated, gone, and they are no more. You can't find them. They either had to change and not be who they were anymore, or they died off. And they left behind no legacy. I hope that this message has been of benefit, and I hope that this story uh, has a lesson in it that will help you in the future, inshallah. The communities are going to have to confront, people in the community are going to have to go back to their people and confront some of the evils that they see especially if the evils have a victim of some sort. Those are the things that are going to have to take more priority. Smoking has a victim. Secondhand smoke has a victim. Drinking might or may not have a victim. But the issues that we have that definitely have victims must be confronted with the priority by the Muslims or we can no longer claim any kind of moral authority and we can barely claim Islam. Because if we don't confront these things, best believe the community will evaporate. And everyone in it that does not leave it will evaporate. Asalaamu As Alaikum.